Welcome to The Big Unlock, where we discuss data, analytics, and emerging technologies in healthcare. Here's some of the most innovative thinkers in healthcare information technology talk about the digital transformation of healthcare and how they are driving change in their organizations. Hello and welcome back to my podcast. This is Patty and it's my great privilege and honor to have as my special guest today, Neil Gomes, Executive Vice President and Chief Digital Officer of Jefferson Health. Neil, welcome to the show. Thanks, Patty. Uh, great to be here and thank you for having me. You're most welcome. So, Neil, let's let's get uh, started uh, for the benefit of uh, our uh, listeners. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, Jefferson Health, about the digital group uh, within Jefferson Health. Uh, yeah, so about four and a half years, so almost five years ago, uh, Jefferson invested in this um, idea that uh, there is tremendous value to be gained at the confluence of digital innovation and consumer experience. And uh, so my group was founded, I helped found it. Um, and what we do is we uh, we focus very strongly on the consumer, and sometimes these can be internal, sometimes these can be external consumers, um, hence the term consumer. Uh, and uh, and then we we know that if we do that, and we anticipate needs in advance of these consumers of ours, uh, uh, you know, even uh, experiencing them, and if we provide for them. Uh, using many times digital innovations, many times design, um, and, um, and and if we provide for them in advance, then there's tremendous value to be generated both for the institution as well as our own consumers. So that's the ethos of this group, and that's what we've been doing over the last five years here. And I'd love to dig into uh, some examples of the, some of the successes that you've had. But before that, let me ask you a question. So Jefferson Health is unique in making a commitment to the kind of group that you lead. You know, it's a standalone specialist group. Uh, you tell us how that came about, and also in the last four, four and a half years, maybe if you could touch on one or two examples of how you've delivered the kind of uh, superior experiences that you just described uh, uh, in, in your earlier comments. Uh, well, uh, this group came about through a joint vision across Jefferson as well as with our. Uh, CEO, President and CEO, uh, Dr. Steve Plasco, uh, who has uh, always felt that there's tremendous value to be generated at these at the Conference of Digital Innovation and Consumer Experience. And uh, he's invested in this at other organizations he's um, been leader at, too. And, uh, and, and we've uh, done a lot of work in this space now in the last five years uh, that proves that this is true. Uh, you know, we've created uh, applications like MyJeff Health, uh, that are focused on the front end patient experience uh, that have been well received by our patients. Uh, we've created back end solutions for our processes to enhance our processes so that we can meet uh, these great front end consumer experiences and, um, and deliver them. Uh, so we've done things, for example, in our ERs that uh, use data in real time to deliver uh, good decision making insights to physicians and clinicians uh, in the ER so that they can, they can deliver care really quickly. They can get uh, patients to a physician really, really quickly. Uh, they can uh, reduce the total amount of time spent in the ER, uh, reduce the left without being seen rates that sometimes uh, hospitals and ERs see a lot of. And, uh, uh, and that way, overall, create a great experience, not just for the patients, who are really important to us, of course, but also for our staff, uh, so that they may be able to feel fulfilled in the work that they do too. And similarly, we've done other work, where, which is uh, um, in both the academic space as well as the clinical space. Um, in, the, in the last five years, we've created several, several such solutions uh, that have changed our institution, as well as now are also starting to change other institutions as uh, people outside of Jefferson also come to us and want us to build these solutions for them. So, so let's talk a little bit about the academic and the health system side of the enterprise, right? The, what are you know? Can you touch on maybe what are some overarching common themes when you try to build experiences for the academic side of the enterprises, enterprise versus the healthcare side? What, what are maybe one or two fundamental differences that you have to take into account? Uh, well, uh, so both these, uh, both the academic and the clinical side. Um, many times in academic medical centers, they come together to form this uh, union of sorts that uh, generates tremendous value just on its own. 
right? And that's why we have a lot of academic medical centers and we should promote uh, academic medical centers and the research that happens at them because it's all ultimately benefiting all of us, uh, you know, as either students or as patients. So many times when we approach problems that come to us from either the academic side or the, or the clinical side, we see it as a common uh, thing, you know, uh, firstly, as a problem that we need to solve. And then we try to delve in deeper and find out what exactly uh, is the cause of this problem, uh, what is the outcome that is desired, and ultimately, how do we design a solution that meets this? And um, there are common themes sometimes across both uh, these pillars, as we call them, uh, but there's also uh, quite a lot of uh, difference between the way that we solve problems sometimes. Uh, on the academic side, we have uh, a lot of research related problems that come to us, uh, and sometimes, uh, and many times, a lot of efficiency related uh, problems that come to us that, uh, that people would like to solve. Um, and there's also an interest many times from the people coming to us with the problems because they are themselves researchers um, to, to be very, very involved in the solution. Um, whereas sometimes on the clinical side, we are seen more as an agency coming in and trying to solve a problem without uh, interfering too much with the day-to-day uh, -day workings of the clinical organization because uh, that needs to keep on moving. You know? and, uh, and, and so we know to how, how to operate in both spaces, and we, uh, we try to be as flexible as possible. Um, with the academic side, we have created several research applications, like the Decision Counseling Program, for example, uh, for whom we created the DCP tool in, uh, in close collaboration with their researchers and their research team. And now it's being used by multiple organizations, not just Jefferson. Uh, we also took a, a long-standing study uh, that was done by Dr. Hoffa uh, on the scale called the Scale of Empathy, uh, and we digitized that so that he could then use it at other institutions too. And he was extremely involved in that. That was literally his baby kind of, you know, in the way that he created it. And, um, and so that was a different level of engagement. Um, and then sometimes we create, uh, in the, on the academic side, we create uh, tools like the clinical rotation tool that we created in collaboration, close collaboration with our COO of the academic pillar, pillar um, uh, Kathy Gallagher. And when we did this work with her, she was very involved with what we did, but uh, we had, uh, this was a brand new application that we were creating. So, so we could really think outside the box and uh, build something uh, from scratch that, uh, that we got very involved in from the design standpoint, all the way to developing the solution, working with administrators to find the right, uh, uh, the right way to express the solution and then ultimately bringing it out to everybody and getting involved in training and all of that to make sure that it had a life of its own. So very different situations from developing, let's say, the research tools. And then finally, in the clinical space, uh, it can be either of the two. You know, sometimes uh, we are called in for discovery uh, to find out what problems might exist in a particular unit or space uh, and help a lot of the operational teams with discovering that. And then sometimes we may be asked to continue on to build digital solutions, <clears throat> excuse me, wherever we see potential for, de for delivering digital solutions. We don't always assume that a digital solution is going to solve the problem. Sometimes it's a very human thing uh, and uh, because we're operating in a very human environment. And sometimes it's just uh, a matter of moving a few things from the human perspective and you don't need to build any new digital solution and we are completely open to that. And then sometimes we have to, and when we have to, uh, we try to get as much as we can in terms of detail around the problem, the outcome, and then build a solution. And then, uh, and then prove along the way to ourselves as well as to our organization that we are solving the problem with the solution that we've created. And if we are not, then we pivot just like any other agile, lean startup kind of group. Uh, we pivot and develop something different or stop doing what we were trying to do. Right, right. So is it fair to say that on the academic side, uh, more often than not, there is some clarity about what is the problem that we are collectively trying to solve, whereas on the clinical side, uh, more often than not, it's a matter of even going through a discovery to find out you know, what the real problem is before you even try to build a solution around it. Is that a... Uh, yeah, is that, yeah, you could... 
you could say that it, it really depends on the problem that comes to us. Uh, but some, because sometimes in the clinical side too, there's a very, very discrete problem. Uh, many of us know those problems. And uh, for many years, no solution has been developed because it's a very complex problem. And so we know what the problem is, but uh, you know, on the clinical side, many times we, we I'd say the distinction really is we're, we're many times focusing on operational uh, tasks and trying to resolve those and create a better experience at the end for the consumer or uh, you know, during the course of the, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to all of the consumers in between that are involved in this value chain. And in the case of academic projects, many times it's a completely brand new idea. It's creating a new scale, let's say, or creating, uh, you know, uh, some kind of new instrument for clinical research. Uh, and it may not, there may not be an operational problem we're trying to solve there. It's just a brand new way of doing things. So it really differs that way, I think, is uh, the way, better way to put it, probably. Right, right, right. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, obviously, when you work across multiple stakeholder groups, there is a big uh, uh, element of gaining alignment, right? And it's not just among the stakeholders who are consumers of the solution, but also stakeholders who are important for the enablement of the solution at an enterprise level, whether it is IT or whether it is operations or or, or whatever group it is. Uh, what, what are some of the, you know, what, is, what have been some of your learnings or what would you suggest as best practices to other organizations that are undertaking their digital journeys and want to make sure that there is a proper alignment across stakeholder groups in order to improve success rates? Uh, yeah, see, I think uh, it's very, very important, of course, to work with the entire organization. Uh, you cannot uh, leave certain people out if they are part of the solution or sometimes even part of the problem, right? So you have to have them engaged because either you're developing something that uh, may be replacing a piece of work that they have been doing, so they, hence you need to build a vision for what's going to happen after that, otherwise people might feel threatened. Um, and then also sometimes it's going to just create this, this great new uh, thing that will solve problems for all, a lot of people, um, you know, reduce the total amount of time they spend in doing things that they don't want to do. Uh, but even in that scenario where it's so positive that it's going to, everyone's just going to be so happy is what you might think. Uh, many times that may not be the case. You know, it may be that, uh, you know, the, this, this problem, uh, someone may have a better insight about that. Uh, they may feel like, oh, this is not really going to be as uh, the, the single pill that fixes everything that you might think, uh, but there's a different perspective to it. There may be a different problem that's causing what you think is the problem. So it's always good to get uh, diverse opinions on a lot of these things before we make them. Um, and uh, also definitely involve a lot of the stakeholders that would be affected by that decision or by that solution. So we try and do that as much as possible also because we need help. You know, we can't do these things on our own. We don't assume that we're going to do them on our own. Uh, we need the help of all of the stakeholders that are involved in the process for uh, building a, uh, a solution and for whom sometimes we are building a solution. And so we do get everyone together as much as we can. IT, marketing, um, are important, uh, uh, are very, very important functions for any digital enterprise to succeed. And so we do need support uh, from, from all of these areas as much as possible. And that's what we try and do um, and engage and involve people from, from not just IT and marketing, but also from research, from the, from the pillars themselves, um, depending on where we are working and what problem we're trying to solve. Uh, from operational groups, sometimes when we're doing work in the IoT space, uh, we, all, we, we always connect with our facilities teams. If we are building something for supply chain, then we involve the supply chain teams, of course, to, uh, to, to inform us, firstly, of what problems they'd like to solve, and then beyond that, as many people from supply chain to figure out how we build a solution. And so also for clinical teams and academic teams. So, um, I mean, you don't want to belabor the process of building a solution by you know, continuously uh, inviting as many opinions as you can, but you have to build the vision of what's going to happen if you solve that problem. Try and get as many people involved as that could help solve the problem, and then move on very quickly uh, to build, uh, as with a lean startup uh, mindset, you know, build 
uh, think big, uh, you know, start small, scale fast, uh, you know, and and, uh, and if you have to fail in between, then uh, then fail early and figure out things as you go along very quickly. Right, right, right. That's very helpful. So switching uh, switching gears here a little bit, you know, uh, healthcare is in early stages of digital transformation today relative to other sectors like consumer banking or uh, e-commerce or any of those other sectors. Now, uh, uh, Jefferson Health you know, and your group in particular deal is uh, probably a little bit uh, ahead uh, because you're a separate group and, you know, you, you had an early vision and made significant progress uh, as an independent group. But what What is your assessment of the current state of digital transformation especially among health systems. And what do you think are the biggest use cases that people are looking at to launch their digital transformation journeys? Uh, well, so uh, I think that it's never too late to start, okay? And uh, if you've ever gone to HIMSS, which is the largest health IT uh, conference, you'll see there's so many people trying to solve complex problems in this industry. And if anyone thinks that, you know, we are one day just going to, uh, rest and say, okay, problem solved. That's never going to happen because we as humans, uh, you know, we'll always figure out another way uh, to fix an existing, uh, so, uh, fix an existing solution sometimes, you know, uh, to make it better, to make it more efficient. And we should be continuously engaged in that kind of work uh, because, you know, optimization is extremely, extremely important and we owe it to patients and uh, students uh, in our industry. Uh, now, yes, healthcare is, I think, uh, a little behind compared to other industries in terms of uh, digital, but uh, that doesn't mean that we are in a bad place. You know, uh, when you are sometimes behind, you can learn from the mistakes of others. You can take these quantum leaps, as we like to call them, to solve problems uh, because you realize, uh, that, you know, what another industry has learned and you try not to repeat that. Uh, you also get new insights from these industries and from what they've done, um, you know, not just what they've done and hasn't worked, but also um, when they've done things that have worked, uh, not just doing the same thing, but trying to fit it into your industry, you realize new things and new ways of doing things that sometimes can even inform other industries. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, we uh, started working on this uh, smart rooms concept about uh, three years ago. Uh, employing AI and machine learning uh, to create a voice assistant for our hospital rooms that could uh, do the things that we, uh, you know, expect from most other voice assistants like Amazon, Alexa, and Google Home and all of that, but go a little bit beyond and start, um, you know, working on the environment or enabling uh, people to interact with the environment of care that they're in. Uh, so we built connections into building automation systems that we use into the TVs that are in the room. Uh, some of the things that you can do with some of your, um, uh, you know, voice assistants for the home, but in a clinical environment, these things are a lot more complex, you know, being HIPAA compliant, ensuring that uh, PHI is protected, uh, personal health information is protected for the patient while they're interacting with these uh, devices that we create for them is quite a complex task. It's not easy. So we started building those things um, and uh, slowly we realized, you know, we are really leading in the space as compared to most other industries because, uh, you know, in the hotel industry, for example, you would have thought that by now the, you would have seen these types of devices in every hotel that you went into. Because when you think about the friction when you enter a hotel room um, that is caused by not knowing uh, what channel <laughs> corresponds to what number on your TV, um, you know, where the remote is, uh, where the light switches are, because the fixtures are all different many times in every hotel that you go into. So you're trying to fiddle around and find those. Instead, as you walked into a hotel room, if you could just say to the room, uh, turn the lights on, uh, you know, you could tell them to turn off so you can conserve energy instead of just leaving the room, leaving them on. If you uh, could tell the TV what channel to go to, if you want, like to watch HBO, you know, just say go to HBO. Um, and it would go there and you're not left, uh, you know, uh, clicking channel after channel to find the right one. And so, uh, you know, other industries are ahead of us in some areas, but in some areas that we are doing work in, we are far ahead. Supply chain, we have a lot of innovations that sometimes other industries, I think, could learn from. So 
especially in, in the perishable, non-perishable kind of areas. Uh, with IOP, they're starting to do a lot of things that other industries have not even started thinking about many times. So there's lots to be learned, I think, from healthcare, uh, but the vice versa is also very, very true. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, so obviously a lot of emerging tech uh, is involved when uh, you think about building the kind of experiences that you're describing and taking examples from other sectors, whether it's hospitality or retail or or anything else. So one of the things I like to do in my podcast is uh, what I call a lightning round. I'm, I'm going to mention a few of the emerging tech uh, terms and uh, we would like to invite your you know, top of the mind sort of comment or response on that. Uh, are we ready to do this? Yeah. Sure. All right. Let's start with this one. Uh, artificial intelligence. I think that's uh, one of the most promising things for any industry, uh, as long as we focus not just on artificial intelligence, but machine learning. Uh, and as long as we keep uh, machine learning as open as possible, algorithms that we create, because people really need to know, especially in healthcare and education, need to know when the machine is making a decision, what is the source of that logic and how it has built that logic. I think that's important. But otherwise, you know, a f phenomenal greenfield kind of area for healthcare and learning. All right. Uh, voice enablement. Uh, uh, yeah, voice enablement and AI are kind of really tied at the hip, I feel, because, you know, voice uh, would not work without uh, all of these uh, deep learning models that we use from AI and, and others, but uh, other types of models. But, you know, it's, it's, I think a voice is the, uh, and, uh, the voice is the best operating system that we have. Uh, we all know it. The learning curve is pretty uh, low and now you can uh, you can you can speak of course these voice assistants can speak in multiple languages So it's not like you have to learn a new language uh, either uh, in order to interact So I think voice is great. Uh, there are limitations. Of course, you know, there's not as much privacy as uh, Many times you might want uh, you know, you uh, uh, Also sometimes want to do things without creating any noise of any kind in many scenarios So uh, so, you know voice might not work in those Otherwise, I think we've not really leveraged voice at all. Um, you know, physicians just talking to a voice assistant, getting information about a patient before they go to see a patient. Our physicians have told us they would love something like that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it reduces friction in so many spaces. I gave you the example of uh, the smart rooms project and, uh, and the example in a different industry like in hospitality. Um, I think, um, I, I think uh, voice is a phenomenal platform. Uh, for growth and uh, creating a great consumer experience for any industry. Awesome. Uh, about 5G networks? Uh, 5G networks, I mean, it's a very technical kind of thing at this point. Uh, I mean, we haven't really been able to uh, see the real effect of it uh, because it isn't here yet, except for maybe a few select cities if I'm, uh, uh, and a few devices, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, any kind of additional bandwidth any kinds of uh, uh, processing power at local endpoints, you know, it's phenomenal to be able to do, right? Uh, and we'll continuously be seeing these types of new technologies come up 6G maybe sometime soon. Uh, but what 5G will really, really enable us to do in healthcare is leverage things like AI, leverage things like uh, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality in ways that make them more portable, that make it more possible to do these things sometimes even, uh, uh, you know, without a lot of, uh, processing power at the device level, uh, which is where we sometimes hit some roadblocks. So I think that's what 5G would be great for. All right. I have one last one on this on this lightning round. Sure. This one is a yeah. term that you know made a lot of waves a year or two ago and then seems to have quietened down a little bit. Blockchain. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I always uh, think of technology as a tool, not as the way to start a conversation. Um, and uh, so when people come to us with sometimes even with a solution, a, a discrete technology solution, I always ask the question, what's the problem? <laughs> uh, what problem are we trying to solve? What is the actual problem you are experiencing and for which you're looking uh, for this particular solution? And I think that many of us in our own, and we are to blame to some extent for this, uh, technologists, you know, really sometimes just pick something and run with it without thinking, okay, well, what are the ways that we could use it? And I think blockchain is one of those things. Um, now, there are lots of 
there's lots of potential for blockchain and healthcare, especially at the confluence of many people working together, like payers and uh, providers and uh, you know pharma companies uh, and the patient, of course, all coming together and then being able to track data and who gets used and access to certain types of data. It would be phenomenal for clinical research. Um, but a lot more work needs to get done, I think, more in bringing people together to do work together rather than just trying to throw the technology at the problem and say, okay, well, this technology could solve it all. And I think a lot of people have realized that have invested in this technology at the outset, have realized that, you know, um, first you have to solve the human problem, uh, you know, and get people to start working together. And then you should apply the technology to it and say, okay, well, this is the technology that can help you do that. Uh, it could help you track, uh, you know, processing of data, cognizance, all those types of things. Um, and I think uh, a, a lot of good companies are now starting to do that, um, you know, create these networks so that we can actually use blockchain and use its benefits in a way that uh, bene- that, that, that that real problems get solved. Right, right. And you mentioned, uh, you know, that it's all about people and, you know, humans. Uh, you know, coming to your own digital innovation group, Tell us about your talent pool, and you, I know you have a you know, specialized unit. What does it take to attract and retain the kind of talent you need to really keep a group like this going? Well, I think the most important thing is the why. Uh, you know, why we do what we do. I think that matters, and being able to get that story out uh, to the to the to the right kinds of people. It's very very important that you get the right kinds of people on a team like this. Um, you know, you have very little margin for error. Uh, you have uh, to create a fantastic culture uh, around this team, uh, base it on principles. We have 12 principles that guide our team. I'm uh, coming out with a book on that because we feel like we've been able to leverage these principles really well and build a good team that can solve, not the perfect team, but a good team that can really, really address these problems in very creative ways, um, get people together to solve them together, not just try and build a solution that is uh, devoid of that insight. And, and then once we build the solution, it has to thrive on its own without us having to be there. So having a team that can also um, say, okay, well, we built something of, of tremendous value. We have given it a life of its own, and that itself is a hard task to achieve. And then being able to focus on another problem to solve is hard many times because people want to own that solution for its life. And that can get difficult to, you know, pull yourself away from. But we've built a team that can do that uh, and that can solve many, many problems. We we address about 120 different initiatives a year, and uh, you know, with this team. And 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 we've uh, and we've created a lot of positive energy across the organization. Uh, we've attracted other organizations to us uh, with this message of innovation as well as actual uh, solutions that we've created. And I think we've created a, a, not just within our team, but across the organization, a, a cohesive mindset that says, okay, we can solve these problems if we work together in healthcare. Um, we can build incentives for people within these value chains that we have so that the consumer at the end, uh, be they in healthcare or education, can see this benefit. And is it a, a transforming healthcare already? In certain ways, yes. But, you know, it takes time to, to build these types of solutions and create momentum and get them out to everyone um, and others even to learn from them. But we've been successful in those areas, too. So I think um, the team's doing well. I think we've picked the right kinds of people. Uh, the message, and I mentioned earlier, I said the story and the why is really important. That's how we also draw people to us. And unfortunately, in healthcare and learning, we do some really, really good work, right? We help people either build lives of their own with education, good learning, or we help them help many times save people's lives, right? When they come to us at the worst times of their lives. So if you want to do something really meaningful with your life, you know, it'd be if you're a programmer, if you're a designer, or if you're a learning specialist, because those are the primary roles that we uh, recruit into our team. Um, then this is a great place to be, uh, you know, this is, uh, and it's a, it's a great mission to serve, you know, and that you will be helping other people either get uh, better, uh, you know, through learning or improve their lives or save their lives, you know, through 
uh, the work of our clinicians and helping them do their work better. Right, and right. Our, uh, faculty right. And the, and the mission driven aspect of it is so important. I was talking to a, a, yeah. a student just this over this weekend, and he's graduating with a degree in computer science, and he wanted to know if healthcare and healthcare informatics was a good place to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, when I when I talked to him, I realized that the mission driven aspect of working in it's something that resonated strongly. So I think we tend to underestimate it or maybe take it for granted. But everyone that I meet in healthcare has some, you know, has some relationship with the mission as missionary aspect of working in healthcare, which I think is fantastic. Uh, all right, awesome. I, last question for you, Neil. What uh, you know, your 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 digital innovation group is obviously doing very exciting things. You know, you're kind of out there at the front end of the curve. What is your advice for technology providers, big and small, who want to be a part of this journey with you? So, um, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, one, uh, invest in people. You know, people uh, are what's going to make or break your team and what you do. Uh, Pick the right people right at the outset. So form a culture within your group uh, that, uh, uh, you know, is, is able to promote innovation uh, entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship, as some people might call it. Um, uh, also, uh, joint decision making around things, but rapid decision making also. Um, and also, I think um, being able to um, just 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 bring people together around a, a vision that you can bring uh, that you can uh, that you can express to others is important. Um, I think, uh, and then once you do that, once you get the right people together, you have these kinds of principles to guide you, uh, this culture that you create of innovation, then uh, it's a matter of finding the right things to do. And um, so I think uh, that's, that's, that's very important. You could have a great team, but if you don't select the right th- things to focus on, uh, you know, you could uh, end up not solving the right problems and therefore not having much momentum. Um, the the other thing I would say is uh, the, there's a kind of equation that we like to think about when we uh, when we uh, when we build this group, and uh, and that was that one you need good people, two you need good partners. So it's not possible to do this on your own. You know, both you need internal partners as I mentioned earlier, but you also need external partners. You need good firms and startups and and other such companies working with you uh, that are focused on many times on healthcare. Sometimes you can learn a lot even from folks that are not in healthcare, and sometimes that, that should be a, a goal. Uh, but work with other people is the message. Uh, you know, you can't do this on your own. And then finally, invest in the right types of platforms. And I'll just spend a few seconds on this. Uh, platforms are very powerful. You know, they enable you to create new solutions at much faster pace, uh, right? Because you're not reinventing the wheel each time. You don't need multiple skill sets to solve multiple problems. Uh, you know, you can use a single really powerful platform if you invest in one uh, to that, that enables you to do solve maybe 50 problems. Uh, and ultimately, you're licensing one platform. So you're paying for all of those solutions, except for the cost of building them, of course, and maintaining them. But otherwise, you might have licensed 50 endpoint solutions, you know, to solve 50 of those problems, you know, which um, which can get really costly. Uh, because we are in an industry that uh, cannot invest uh, as many other industries do sometimes in innovation at the same scale. Uh, you know, so we've got to build things very frugally. We've got to find ways to solve problems very creatively and very quickly, but also uh, many times at a lower cost to our organizations. So I think it's very important to invest in platforms in order to be able to do that. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Neil. That was that was really interesting, and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and for sharing some of your experiences. And all the best to the Digital Innovation Group at Jefferson Health. Thank you once again for joining. Thanks, Barry. I really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Subscribe to our podcast series at www.thebigunlock.com and write to us at info@thebigunlock.com.